Thank you, Rob, and praise team, and thank you for being here today. Hi, I'm Gary Shouse, uh, Associate Pastor for Pastoral Care. I've been hanging around here almost 33 years. I've retired twice, and both times you let me come back. So uh, it's a joy to serve you. I did that, and I do that because I love you, and I love to see what God is doing in this great church. And he is doing a great work. And we give him praise for that. Before I begin the message, I do want to share a prayer need. And I didn't get permission to do this, but uh, our college pastor, Austin Baum, two weeks ago preached a great message. And a part of that message he shared with us about the, the battle that his mother was facing with cancer. On Thursday morning, early Thursday morning, she unexpectedly walked from this life into the presence of Jesus. She won that battle. And I want you to pray for Austin, <clears throat> for his family, especially the funeral will be tomorrow and Austin will preach that celebration of life service. So you pray for our college pastor as he walks through this with his family. Again, thank you for the opportunity to share with you as we continue the summer in the Psalms. And we're gonna look at Psalm 13 today. Psalm 13, and in this we see that David is expressing his deepest inmost feelings, and he's exhausted, he's depressed. Yet in this writing, David gives us a good outline of how to handle life's toughest situations that cause us to feel so down and despondent. David's troubles with King Saul had gone on for years. He was very discouraged. He had lost the joy in his life. He felt that he simply could not continue, not for another day, not for another hour, not for another minute. Many of us, maybe most of us, have been right there. It may have been a long drawn out sickness or a financial problem that's brought about radical changes in our lives. Maybe it was a wayward child an alcoholic spouse, an unsaved loved one. It may have been a bad situation at work with bad relationships with coworkers or a demanding and unreasonable boss. It could be a host of other things, but today some of you feel like you're at the end of your rope. Others of us have been there before. But when we get to the end of our rope, we need to understand that it gives God an opportunity. And when we don't know what to do, and we're without resources, without direction, and we're desperate, that's when we will eventually, it's our nature, to turn things over to God, and he begins to work. Oh, that we would learn to do that before we get to the bottom. But usually before God will do anything about our situation or our problems, he wants to do something within us and for us. We want God to fix our situation and God wants to develop our character. Instead of changing our circumstances, God wants us to change. And we see that in the life of David in this passage. God wants to do for you what he did for David. And he wants to take you out of the pit and the miry clay and set your feet upon the rock and put a new song in your mouth. Listen as we read Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God, Lift up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I believe the psalmist, David here, is in desperation. And yet I believe he shows us in how he processed his situation 
and how we can handle tough times in our life. And the first thing we must do is recognize and be honest about our current situation. David was honest, brutally honest, and he was letting God know that he felt abandoned and that he was depressed. Four times, he said, how long? How long? How long? How long? Look at these verses again in one and two. He said, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? That phrase, how long, is a familiar question in scripture. In Psalm 6, verse 3, the Bible says, My soul is also greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? It's okay to ask that question, particularly if our hearts are right with God and we're truly seeking to be his faithful servant. The saints in heaven even ask it in Revelation 6, verse 10. Martyrs for Christ. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you would judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? This question, how long, is not just asking for information, but it's expressing the feeling of being unable to endure it any longer. The psalmist begins by asking questions without waiting or expecting an answer. Maybe it's because deep in his heart that he wasn't even allowing God to uh, see that right now, but deep in his heart, he knew the answers. You know, as teenagers, especially, we ask questions of our parents sometimes when we already know the answer. When I was a teenager, I used to ask my dad, when will it be or how long will it be before I don't have a curfew? I knew the answer. The, the rules had already been set. And my dad would always look at me and say, you'll have a curfew as long as you live in this house. Now that I'm a lot older and maybe a little wiser, maybe that was dad's way of trying to get me to move out. <laughs> well, four times in these verses, David begins a statement with the words, how long? And it was his way of saying to God, here, Lord, I'm talking to you. I'm trying to get through to you. And David just felt so abandoned. And this repetition of these words, how long, it, it also adds emphasis to the statements that he's making. We see in verse one, first of all, that David felt that God had forgotten him. You've heard people say, say how time flies when you're having a good time. And it does. But I wanna to say to you, the opposite is true when you're not having a good time. The opposite is true when you're down about as low as you can get. Imagine how long the night was for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed all night while his disciples couldn't stay awake. Jesus prayed that God would find another way, that God the Father would let this cup pass from him. He was alone with his father and his friends had abandoned him. One of them even betrayed him. And I submit to you that when times are tough, it's not unusual to see your friends drift away. And some may even turn against you, but our heavenly father is always there, always cares, always listens, and always answers. When we face life's toughest battles and we feel abandoned even by God, we must remember that Jesus has been there and he knows exactly how we feel and he's right now by the Father's side pleading our case for us. Well, David had not only felt the Lord had forgotten him, but he also felt abandoned by him. He said in verse one, how long will you hide your face from me? Remember, God is never in a hurry and he's always on time. He wants these opportunities to shape and to mold us into the people he wants us to be. 
And God is doing a work in us even when we may not realize it. He has not abandoned us. Yes, these can be painful times that we face, but we can learn our lessons and we can become better people because God is there with us. David really felt that God had abandoned him and he was hiding his face from him, a familiar phrase in the Old Testament. David knew from experience that to behold God's face by faith and to see his glory was always encouraging. It was always life-changing. Look in Psalm 11, verse seven. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Psalm 17, verse 15. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Psalm 27, one thing have I asked of the Lord and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek? You see, David was longing for those type of experience. That's not where he was right now. He was feeling abandoned and he was depressed. Verse two teaches us that David had been brought low by his situation. Again, most of us know how we feel about ourselves when tough times come. Our self-esteem plummets to an all-time low. And if you haven't been there, you will be because that's life. And we all have to deal with situations like that. David, I believe, was talking about that knot in his stomach. The thought of food nauseated him. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. Every time we try to get our mind on something else, back our situation comes. That gnawing ache inside and we slip right back into the circumstances that surround us. Well, David's showing us here how not to do that because he was no longer at this point master over his emotions. His feelings had brought him down. <clears throat> his enemies in verse four had done the same. How long was David going to let other people determine how he feels? We're so guilty of letting other people give us a bad day. Church, I want to submit to you that we choose how we respond. We choose how we speak and we choose how we feel. So don't let others make that choice for us. King Saul was after David and Saul had all the resources he needed to hunt him down and defeat him. You see, Saul was a physical giant 1 Samuel 9, 2 says, for his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. But God was making David into a spiritual giant. I don't know what's going on in your life today, but I believe God may be making spiritual giants out of all of us. David felt abandoned and depressed and he didn't know what God had awaiting for him. So we must be honest about our current situation. But number two, we must be honest with God about how we feel. David expressed his feelings to God. And in the first two verses, David had been crying out to God with great emotion, probably uncontrollable emotions. But in these next two verses, David begins to move forward in the process. And he becomes more deliberate more thoughtful, more rational in his prayer. Look what he said, consider and answer me, O Lord my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. You see, David begins to express to God that the road he's on would take him away from the meaningful life that he so wanted to live. 
It would take all of that out of him. He said even physical death would be a result. Pay close attention here. He, he asked for three things. He made three requests of God. First, he said, consider me. Look on me, he was saying. This was a plea for God to fix his eyes on his servant and even to scrutinize him. Psalm 139 verses 23 and 24 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Second thing he said was, answer me. David was asking for encouragement and he felt deserted and wanted to see some results of his prayers. And then he said, light up my eyes. David needed spiritual enlightenment and physical vitality. He needed the strength to go on. In Psalm 19, verse eight, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. When we need spiritual strength, this is where we find it. In the word of God, in the precepts of the Lord. That's why we need to spend time every day in God's word. In verses three and four, we see where David began to nail his emotions to a glorious truth. He called upon God as Jehovah Elohim. Jehovah means God of promise. Elohim means the God of power. And he called on the God of promise and the God of power to rescue him. David remembered that God, through the prophet Samuel, had anointed him as Israel's next king. So for Saul to get to David meant that he must go through God first. So David attached his emotions <clears throat> to that promise in the word of God. Look at verse four. And we're reminded in verse four that we have all lost some battles in our lives. But we must realize that we're on God's side and we'll win the war. We've read the end of the book. We know what happens. And God has a wonderful plan for all of our lives, not only at that time as we enter into eternity, but for today and for tomorrow. Now I'm going back in time. Have any of you ever played checkers? Well, when I was a kid, we used to play checkers. We did that because we didn't have video games or cell phones or even a television. <clears throat> Sometimes I would play checkers with a great uncle of mine. And we'd begin that game and it seemed that I was about to beat him and it seemed that he was making some bad moves and I was able to jump his checkers and remove that checker from the board. And then suddenly he would say, crown me. And before I knew what happened, click, 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 click. He got all my checkers and I lost. And he had learned the value of losing a few of his checkers because he knew he was heading into king territory. Christians, we can afford to give up a few things in life if we know we're headed in the king's territory. One day we'll receive a crown and we can learn even today to live by faith and trust God. We can learn to give up a few of our liberties. We can learn to do the things that count for eternity because that's the only things that will last. And I think David was expressing his faith his faith that God would deliver him before his enemies had an opportunity to rejoice. And like David, I think we need to be honest about our current situation and be honest about our feelings. And number three, let's all place our complete trust in God. This process of David has moved rapidly and David moves into this final stage of his experience of this trial and testing and he offers praise to God. He'd come through the tears to the truth and through the truth to triumph. 
And that's a journey we must make. Look at verses five and six. He said, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You see that first word there, but. I believe at that point, David moved from fear to faith. He knew he could trust God. He knew God was powerful. He knew God had made promises to him. And sometimes we can wonder why David could move so swiftly from gloom to gladness. That's it, because he moved from fear to faith. The secret is found in the fact that David, in the middle of this psalm, began to focus his eyes upon the Lord, the God of promise and power. Many years ago, I was young in the ministry, but I was serving a church in Louisiana and our church was in a severe crisis. Satan seemed to be winning the battle. As a staff, we would get together and we'd meet and it seemed like all we did was talk about the problems. And one day my pastor came into my office and he said, let's go fishing. <laughs> I thought that's a pretty good suggestion. So I said, let's go. We packed up. And we made our way to Lake Concordia in Faraday, Louisiana, one of our favorite fishing lakes. But driving up Highway 61 south of Natchez, God changed our vision. We were no longer looking at the problems and we began to look at Jesus and the character of Jesus. And in that old Chevy truck, we began to sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We had revival. No, we didn't turn around and go back to work. We did go fishing for a couple of days. But during those two days, we continued in the spirit of revival and God was doing a work in our lives that I've gone back to that moment many times. And we began to just continue to remind ourselves that God was on the throne. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus came walking on the water to the disciples? You see, he had sent them off in the boat while he remained on the shore. And they were halfway across the Sea of Galilee and were caught in a severe storm. And they were obviously afraid then they saw what they thought was a ghost on the water. But Jesus said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter, one of my favorites said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He wasn't gonna swim to him. He saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Jesus, if that's you, command me to come to you on the water. In Peter's excitement, he heard Jesus' command say, come. And when he heard that, he got out of the boat and he walked on the water to Jesus. But it was after he got to Jesus that Peter began to see the waves that were lashing at his feet. He could feel the wind in his face. Maybe he heard the thunder and he saw the lightning and he began to sink. Why? because he took his eyes off Jesus. But Jesus reached his hand out, lifted him up, and I believe they walked together back to that boat and got in the boat. Well, David is feeling that same kind of experience in Psalm 13, and he expressed his trust in the Lord's unfailing love and just knew that if he could stay focused upon the Lord, that God would rescue him. His faith and his trust in God assured him of salvation, both salvation from Saul and his eternal salvation. It's good to note here that David is now not down low and depressed, but David is now standing and singing victoriously. And not only could he sing about his salvation, but he could sing about the fact that God is sufficient. You see, when my pastor and I got back to Louisiana, to the church we served, 
the problems were still there. David knew that nothing had changed in his circumstances, but something has changed in his heart. He has been reassured of who God is and he, that God has not changed. Notice that David looks back and he says, I will sing to the Lord for he's been good to me. David knows that God is faithful. David knows that he had promised him that he would one day be king of Israel. So he's now trusting God and he's singing praises, not because God had delivered him, he's doing that before that deliverance came. And that's what we need to learn to do. And God knows where each of us are, the journeys we're on. He knows your circumstances. And I believe he's doing a work in all of our lives. And I know that he wants nothing but the best for us. He promised us a full and meaningful life, an abundant life. How long has it been since you felt his love? How long has it been since you felt his promise? How long has it been since you felt his hope? How long has it been since you felt his joy? Are you focused on your circumstances? Have they begun to overwhelm you? Tell God how you feel. Go to his word and be reminded of the promises and the power of God. Look into his eyes. Turn your eyes to Jesus. See who he is. See his character. See his grace in your life. And know this, God is bigger than whatever problems you face. Trust him, rejoice in him, sing his praise. He's getting ready for all of us to live our best life. He's getting us ready for our eternal life in heaven. Look quickly at our next steps. As you consider your current circumstances, I want you to reread Psalm 13 and follow David's outline. List the things or problems that are facing you today. Just be honest with God. Be honest with God and tell him how you feel. Trust God and give praise to God for who he is. Renew your commitment, number two, and have a daily time in prayer and Bible study. As Pastor David has taught us, Find your chair and spend time in the Word of God and talking to God. Number three, encourage and pray with a friend that you know is dealing with tough decisions in their life right now. They need you to come into their life and put your arm around them and to pray with them. And I believe we can begin these next steps right now as we begin this time of commitment. We'll have pastors and others will be standing at the front. Come and don't stay in the mire and the tough situation you're in, but begin today to praise Jesus. Follow Christ. For some, like one adult man in the first service, come and find Jesus. Give your heart to him and be saved. Maybe for others, you just need to surrender whatever's going on in your life to God and just come and pray with one of our pastors or one of these encouragers. Like Jesus said to Peter when he wanted to come out to him on the water, I say to you, come and let God do a work in your life because we serve the same God. Rob, lead us as we sing. Would you stand? And let's do what God's telling us to do.